And so we've gone all the way through, John. We're going to kind of go back and we're going to revisit a few things that I think um, probably are the highlights of the book. Um, and I guess, you know, if there were a central theme of the book, it would be that God has come in the flesh. Because that seems to be the defense that we continue to see over and over about who Jesus is. He's the Messiah, the one to come. He is God's Son. And, you know, basically the question that we started with before we started with John, or uh, previous to starting John, was what would God in the flesh be like? And John paints us this picture and this portrait of, of Christ. Um, you know, how would he live in a relationship to the Father once he came to earth? We see that being answered. How would people know that he was God? Some other questions that uh, we asked were, would he force people to believe in him? What about those who refuse to believe he was God? And what about those who do believe, who followed him? What would God in the flesh expect from man? And as we kind of see the story unfold, we start seeing those questions being answered. And we also see um, the three other Gospels had already been written at this time. So there was a very specific purpose that John had. And a lot of the things that are mentioned in John are not mentioned in the other um, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And again, because we, we know this was a first-hand account, of everything that John had, but he had a much different purpose of his writings than anyone else, uh, all, all three of the others. Um, as we kind of broke it down, uh, basically the chapters 1 through 12, um, whenever you kind of read that, um, we see Jesus starting to emerge and starting to um, be known to mankind. And then as we move from John chapter 12 into John chapter 13, um, we see that that's where people uh, in John chapter 12 and verse 12, on the next day the large crowd had come to Him to the feast when they had heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches and they throw out the palm trees uh, and went out to meet Him. And then we see in chapter 13, the, um, He turns now to His disciples and then we start to see um, the... Um, fulfillment of his time here on earth and the fulfillment of his mission. So that's kind of how the book kind of breaks down. Um, so let's go back to John chapter 1 and let's just kind of mosey through this. Uh, again, I don't think we're going to make it all the way through because if we did that, I'd have to take about two minutes per chapter and I don't know if I could do that or not. Um, but what we do see in John chapter 1 is how God decides to introduce himself to mankind in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that John chooses those words exactly also, and he says, in the beginning was the Word. So, as God spoke things into existence, we see that the Word was there, and then it says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he leaves no question about what he's going to be talking about, and that is the Word of God and how He came to be in the flesh. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has not come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And as we go through this section, you can see He's given us a rough outline of what He's going to be talking about. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light which came, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he, came, he gave to them the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh, and it dwelt amongst us. He saw His glory, we saw His glory, and <clears throat> as, the one, as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he talks about John's testimony. So 
what he's basically done for us in John chapter 1 is talked about basically everything he was going to say. He just gave us kind of a rough draft, a foundation, as it were, to build the rest of the story upon. And so now that we've kind of read through it, we can kind of see that. Um, it's a little hard to see that when you're starting at the very beginning, but now we've gone through that, it's very easy to kind of see that he's going to fill in those blanks for us now. He gives us his testimony of John, and what was John's testimony? He was a witness of Christ, and he also says, um, well, he, there, he's asked a couple of questions. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And he said, no, I'm not any of that. So what was John's role? Correct. In verse 23, he gives the scripture of who he is. So he is the fulfillment of scripture also, or the prophecy that was given. And he says, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. And so he is saying he's playing his role in all of this, but he's not the one that fulfills the scriptures. And we see in verse 24 how they had been sent from the Pharisees, uh, some people who came to question him, um, and they asked, well then, why are you baptizing? Now that's an interesting question as to why they would ask that. Why do you think they asked that question? What were they looking for? If you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, you're not the prophet, then why are you baptizing? They're trying to figure out who he is, and if he is the Christ, why is he taking over what the Christ should be doing? And you know, so it's confusing them. And he answers, and he answers them. Um, John answered them by saying, "I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie." These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan uh, where John was baptizing. He says, I'm baptizing in water, but there's going to be one amongst you who's greater than I. And, you know, so he's playing his role. And what we'll see later on is that water baptism continues to show up through specifically the other Gospels. But John starts to kind of sprinkle it in uh, also with that. Go ahead. So Baptizing was connected with making disciples, and they're trying to figure out why. Why are you making these disciples if you're not the Christ? They, they didn't understand that preparatory work. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, whenever I see that, you know, and I see that, you know, he's trying to say, I'm still not him. That, and we'll see him give his disciples away basically to the Christ, and um, later on, because the next day he sees Jesus coming out. And he says in verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So whatever it is that they're looking for, they're not looking at it the right way. They're looking at a very, you will see that throughout the, throughout the book, is that they are looking at it very physically. However, John is talking about something else, something that goes far beyond. And then he goes on in verse 31, um, this, or verse 30, this is he on behalf of whom I said, after, after me comes a man who is higher in rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, remember some of the conversation that we had whenever, with the Jews and Jesus whenever there's this whole exchange about, uh, well, you're not even 30 years old, and yet you, you claim that you're, you've been there. You know, they're a little confused with that whole situation you talk about Abraham. And so he's, you know, John basically tells him this. Interestingly enough, some of the questions that Jesus has for the Pharisees is the baptism of John. From heaven or from men? And what was their thinking? I go back to my notes. I think they thought it was a trap. Yeah, and that's how they look at things. You know, it's not like. 
yeah, it's like a chess game, you know, I need to move this here and move this here. It's a game that they win. And that's how, you know, we need to make sure that we don't get caught up in that as well. It's just the fact that, you know, it was from God. And it's obvious it was because Scripture's being quoted here. We also see that um, when, when John makes that, that statement, um, it's he who comes after me. I, he, he's been, been here long before me. He was, existed long before me. And, um, and then he says in verse 28, these things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing, so they know, we know exactly where, where it was. Um, whenever we see in verse 32, John's testimony says this, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove of heaven and he remained upon him. A lot of people picture that, you know, there's a dove there, but it says as a dove, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a metaphor. And um, we see, I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So there's obviously two different types of baptisms that we're talking about here um, with the water baptism and then the Holy Spirit baptism. The reason I want to talk about that, and I had it noted, was because there's a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit baptism and what it is. So what is the religious world, what do they view the Holy Spirit baptism as? Go ahead, Nancy. Uh, yeah, yeah, miraculous application of the Holy Spirit. Miraculous. Yeah, and you, you know, and it happens at what point? At the point you believe you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. However, the evidence that we see of the Holy Spirit whenever it descends upon people is far different than that. And the first one that we see um, that happen is in Acts chapter 2. And then in Acts, after Acts chapter 2, we see it again happening in Acts chapter 10. And as a matter of fact, Peter, who was in Acts chapter 2, said what he saw in Acts chapter 10 was exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2. And so we see all of that come about because of Jesus. But that does not mean that every single one of them were going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. However, what is the Spirit? We know it's the Word of God. And we know that the Word of God, um, we, we do know that we live our lives uh, according to the Word of God. In other words, we you know, put ourselves into the work of God uh, by that. Um, in verse 34, he says, I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. So he's, he knows this. And, um, and he makes this statement. Now, later on, as we continue on, we see somewhat of this verse start to kind of play out again in John chapter 3, we won't turn there right now, but with the man of Nicodemus, I want to kind of keep that in mind as we um, move through here because we're talking about water and spirit and you know, uh, stuff like that. So in verse 39, he said, He came and um, come and you will see. Um, or they, they ask him, you know, Rabbi, we, where are you staying? And they're interested. He says, well, come and see. So they and uh, saw that he was staying. They stayed with him that day for about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And then he goes and he finds Simon. And he says, "Hey, found something." Um, and he says, "We found the Messiah," which is translated means Christ. So, what do we know about that statement that Andrew says? He already knows who this man is. And we see that also um, he's going to go tell his family. That's the first people you want to talk to. And so he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. And that whole exchange just kind of ends there. And then we see the next day he purposed to go to Galilee and he found Philip. Philip said, follow me. And he said to Philip, follow me. Now, Philip was uh, from Bethsaida in the city of Andrew and Peter. So they're all kind of from the same area. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we found the one of whom Moses and the law of prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael says to him, what? Behold, 
things good to come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Are you kidding me? Now, how quickly did it take him to change? Um, he said, well, Philip says, we'll come and see. And so Jesus sees Nathanael coming to him and he says, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And um, so what convinces Nathanael? How, how do you know me? Oh, you must be talking about me. How do you know me? How do you know who I am? And Jesus answers what? Saw him under a fig tree, and Nathaniel says, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And, you know, Jesus is almost taken back by this. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said that you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You're going to see far greater things than these. And we continue to kind of press back to that statement that Jesus makes to him, specifically as we move through the book, you're going to see far greater things. And Nathaniel's with him through the whole uh, book, even though he's not mentioned that much. And you know that was one of the things that um, you know, kind of grabbed me out of the whole book, was that the apostles are not mentioned very much in John. Instead, it is much more focused on who Christ is, His work, His signs, His teaching, and then His sacrifice. Instead of you know, what the apostles are doing and stuff like that, the, the book is just not focused on them. All right, so we see the first miracle happen. What's the first miracle in John chapter 2? Turns water into wine. Where does he do this at? At a wedding in Cana. And we see that, you know, at this point, you know, he's got kind of a couple of people that's following him around a little bit. You know, they're kind of wondering, okay, where are you staying? Let's, we'd like to stay with you. And now we start to see things come a little bit more public. Um, this is, of course, it's still very much a, a private thing that happens just um, for this wedding party. Um, but we see and we talked a, a lot about, you know, what Mary was saying and, you know, why she thought what she did and, you know, we can only surmise a lot of that. But what we do see is this miracle happens and it astonishes people. In verse, um, in verse 11 it says, This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Um, now, we see this start to happen and I think that verse is very important because it says this is where those signs actually started to happen. There was really nothing that happened previous to that. Um, you know, any kind of physical sign or manifestation of who he actually was. So these guys were just kind of taking his word on it and something about him was great. Um, and it could be that you could say, well, I didn't understand, you know, seeing Nathaniel under the fig tree, you know, that was kind of astonishing, Nathaniel. So here's the first sign, though, that John's uh, talking about that he starts to show and manifest in his glory. After this, he goes down to Capernaum, and him and his mother, his brothers, and disciples, and they stayed there a few days. And then we have this Passover of the Jews was near and so Jesus goes up to Jerusalem so now we're getting a, a larger crowd uh, he finds the temple and what happens in the temple yeah you know they through the years they turned this into a marketplace a flea market so to speak and Jesus said that's not what this is for and so is he tame about it I mean, is he quiet about it is he just kind of stirred in the spirit and that's it what happens Table. Turn it over tables. I mean, he is enraged and outraged by this. And, you know, that something so sacred and holy has been used in this way. You're talking about, you know, the temple of God here. Go ahead, Steve. And they're, they're buying and selling things, like you said. It's kind of this market. But they're doing it in the name of religion. They would have viewed it as this is perfectly compatible. I mean, we're just facilitating worship here. Um, we have a lot of people around us today, they'll do things with the belief that, oh, we're actually furthering, you know, enhancing worship or serving God or something like that. And they're doing exactly what the Jews were doing here. Yeah, very good. You know, and it's also, you know, it and I don't know where it all started. It doesn't really say that. It's just that he goes there and he sees this. Now, I would assume this isn't his first time to the temple. However, 
something happens in here that he's ready to um, take care of business here. And so, you know, we don't really know what happened previous to that, but we do know this outlandish thing that they're doing uh, enrages him. And we see in verse 17, his disciples remembered what was written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so he is consumed by this zeal for the house of God and he is cleansing it. And so, um, and as Stephen pointed out, it could have been somebody just thought something very innocently. Let's make it very convenient for the poor people to come in and buy the stuff. You know, whatever it started as, it is going completely awry. And anything that is in addition to what God has said is a right. Doesn't matter if it's an inch close or a mile close, it is still not the truth. All right. Um, so he makes this statement. The Jews said to him, well, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And so he's flipping these tables over and all that kind of stuff and they want to see a sign and I want to kind of keep that in mind because we're going to talk about signs and stuff here very shortly. So what sign do you do to show that you have authority uh, to do these things? And Jesus says, I'm going to give you a sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll... I'll... So what's he talking about? I'll bring you... I'll rebuild it. Yeah, and they didn't see that. Now that we read through John, we know exactly what he was saying. In other words, there's your sign. That resurrection was the ultimate sign of belief, is what he says here. That's where I get the authority to do these things. That I am the Messiah, I am the Christ, I am the Son of God and all the other things that are described to Him, ascribed to Him throughout the Scriptures. I am all of those things. And the Jews kind of start scoffing at Him. It took 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days? So they're scoffing at Him. Now remember when He's on the cross, what were some of the things that were being thrown to Him? Some of the insults. Do I? He, was called, he, was called the he was called the King of the Jews. This statement is thrown right back in his face. And we see that um, in verse 22, so when he was raised from the dead, so we, we've got to read it. In verse 22, John tells us, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So that very sign is the ultimate sign of who he is. All right. Um, now, was in Jerusalem at Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. So there was obviously some other things uh, going on. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them because he knew, uh, he knows about man and, and knows all men and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man for he himself knew what was in man and then we see this conversation happen between Nicodemus and Jesus and there's a lot of confusion that Nicodemus has now there's one thing that's not confusing and that is um, in verse uh, 2 Rabbi we know that you come where we know that you come from God if he comes from God, and these signs are what's convincing them of that, then what ought to be their reaction? They should be believing on him and worshiping him. Exactly. They should be followers of him. And even Nicodemus himself has some questions. And so. Um, Jesus answered to him because of what he says. Jesus answered to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I look at that verse and I see this a lot of times. You know, whenever we talk to our uh, friends and our neighbors and our families about um, becoming Christians and they just don't quite understand why you don't have mechanical instruments and they don't understand why you do the Lord's Supper because they can't see it. 
And the reason they can't see it is because they're not part of it. And it says in verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's beyond his perception of that. And so it's only when one shows that act of submission into the kingdom of God is he able to kind of see why we do what we do. So it's a very difficult thing that we have whenever people start asking questions and stuff like that. All we can do is point back to the Scriptures. But it's very hard for people to perceive that and why we do the things that we do. But whenever they go down into the waters of baptism and they submit to that for the remission of their sins, what's, what is their admittance when they do that? What are they admitting? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and they are going to submit their life to Him. Correct. So with that act, they are demonstrating their change of belief. Correct. Again, the process of transformation. Exactly. So, that is a new beginning. That is what we, we state, is that everything previous to that, I have been lost. And now, that's why whenever you come up out of the waters of baptism, it's a little easier to see things much more clearly because you know that you've been wrong about the very foundational thing of just being saved. So there's a whole lot that you can be wrong about. And so then it is very much, much easier to see the kingdom of God than once you are actually in the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, <clears throat> I would submit that verse 3 and verse 5 are parallel verses. And what Jesus states in verse 3, He comes back and states it from another angle in verse 5, where born again in verse 3 is born of water and spirit in verse 5. See the kingdom in verse 3 is enter the kingdom in verse 5. So He's, he's reiterating, trying to get, because in between there, of course, Nicodemus, He's just all confused about, wait a second, you're saying I have to, you know, how does that work? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not talking about the physical birth here. I'm talking about something else. And he, he comes back to reiterate that to him in just a slightly different thing. So, see the kingdom and enter the kingdom would be parallel statements in there. Right, exactly. They're, they're synonymous with one another. And without that rebirth, and what we see, um, to your point in verse 5, what we see without water and the Spirit, you do not have that rebirth. There is no entering the kingdom at that point. And so, um, also, whenever he's talking about being born again, um, in verse 4, he says uh, to him, well, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter into a second time into his mother's womb, can he be? So we're talking about being born, and then in verse 5, look at what the, the answer is. The answer is, this is how you're born again. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So being born again means that you are now in the kingdom of God. Um, and we also see in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. He's obviously having a hard time uh, understanding that. And then, uh, when the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not uh, know where it comes from, where it's going, so everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus said to him, but how can these things be? So he's uh, really diving really kind of deep in there, and you're talking about one of the Pharisees, one, someone who's sitting on the council and is having a hard time grasping what Jesus is talking about. Go ahead. And we, we can appreciate how Nicodemus is struggling with this because as a Jew, he thought, I was born a right. Jew, a descendant of Abraham, so I'm locked in. Jesus is telling him, no, you're not. You have to be born again. Right. And it has to be of the Spirit. And we see, you know, throughout the Scriptures how that kind of happens also. That, you know, um, there's not going to be a time whenever you can say, I'm a Jew and I'm born into it, so therefore I'm God's chosen. You, you have to give your heart and your mind up. And you have to be faithful to God. It's nothing, um, you know, something that transcends the, the flesh. And so, um, 
you know, he, he really is struggling this way. And I would say that it probably has a, he probably has a slanted view of what uh, a Jew should be and, um, you know, and who the Messiah will be, who the Christ will be. So G, uh, Nicodemus obviously wants to understand. And I believe that he wants to understand, first of all, because he knows he's already admitted Jesus is the Christ. No one can do the things that you do without God being with him. And so... Um, Jesus tells him, you know, don't, don't wonder at this. Uh, Nicodemus says to him, verse 9, how can these things be? Jesus answers him, are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? These are very basic concepts that we're talking about here. But because he can't see beyond the flesh or, you know, beyond what his teaching has always been, it's very hard for him to grasp on something else. So he's having to be retaught. And this is a leader... I got you, Rick. Um, and this is a leader of the Jews. He ought to be able to understand these things. Go ahead, Rick. Just a thought. Um, his way of thinking here comes across as something that most of the disciples had in the early day. They were still thinking the physical kingdom, the physical kingdom. They were not thinking spiritually, I guess. And that's yeah, and we see that throughout the book of John is the Jews really have a hard time with moving beyond this idea of a fleshly kingdom, a kingdom that is of this world. And Jesus basically says, my kingdom is not of this world. And so we see much later on you know, in John how it continues to kind of develop <coughs> into... Well, I believe Jesus for the little parlor tricks that he can do. But whenever it comes to rubber hits the road, and I'm talking about when we get to John chapter 5, there, he starts really kind of going at them. They start to turn back and go, I don't know about all this. This guy's a little nutty. And so um, we see that um, as, as this um, progresses on, this conversation progresses on, in verse 12, he says, If I told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So I'm telling you something very basic, and yet you can't grasp it, and I'm trying to put it in words that you can understand, and you want me to talk to you about heavenly things, you're certainly not going to understand. No one has ascended to a heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so much the Son of Man uh, be lifted up. And so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And he that is a reference back to what story of Moses? And the serpents, remember the serpents? Yeah, they were they were let loose on the children of Israel. And he holds up that that um, that serpent up in the air and what happens? They look on it. They look on it, they'll be healed, they'll be saved. And if you look at what is called the Cadiceus, on the EMS, that's exactly what that is. There's a staff there with a snake around it. And so that is a reference uh, to this also. Um, but what we see here, as this continues on, and he says, so whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And here's why that eternal life is offered. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's His purpose. And then it says, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And we talked about that before from about uh, verse 17 through 21. It's probably John talking about verse 16 because he's talking about the light and stuff like that that he had referenced in um, John chapter 1. And we also see some of the same language being used in uh, First and Second John as well. Uh, however that is, we do know that this was given, that this is the judgment. The light is coming to the world now. And we also see that after these things, uh, Jesus' and disciples came into the land of Jesus and He was spending time with them. And guess what He was doing? 
He was baptizing, making disciples, just like what we talked about. Um, all right, so let's move on down. Um, and we, um, I want to move on into chapter 4. Some questions start to happen. When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. What is this? What What's the story here that we start? The woman at the well. And here she is, out there getting this water, and then Jesus asked for what? Give me a drink. She's taken back by that, and she even makes that statement. Um, in verse 9, the, the Samaritan woman says to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? Now, John kind of puts this little parenthetical statement in there so that we understand exactly what's going on. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And we go back into history, find out why I'm not interested in that. But at that present time, Jews and Samaritans did not talk. They had no dealings with them whatsoever. And here Jesus is asking something of them, of this woman. And Jesus says to her in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that you says to, to you, give me a drink, you would have asked Him and, we, and He would have given you living water. So if you were able to see who you're talking to, you would be the one asking for a drink. And it wouldn't be a drink from the well. Where would it be? A living water. So she's still not understanding exactly what all that means. So in verse 11, she says what? Okay, I'll get you the water. So where's your cup or whatever? Because the well's deep, and how do I get to that living water? So, you know, at least she's engaged in the conversation. And she says in verse 12, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And so he is trying to help her make that really jump but that step into from thinking of things carnally thinking of things spiritually and if you look back now and go back into and then you go back forward that's exactly what Jesus continued to struggle with and I think Nancy pointed that out or somebody pointed that out um, earlier was that Jesus main focus was going from the carnal into the spiritual and he's helping her do that She's excited about that. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and I only have to come all the way down here to drink. She's still not quite there, you know, so he's just, you know, slowly bringing her in. And he said to her, go call your husband. So now he kind of takes a different approach with her. And what does she say? I ain't got a husband. I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, well, you've rightly said that. You have no husband because the man you're with is not your husband. And what else? You had five. So how would this man, this Jew, sitting at the uh, thirsty Jew, <laughs> sitting at the well, know all of that? In verse 9, I perceive what? You are a prophet. So there's something special about this thirsty Jew sitting there. And she says, Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus says to her, Before long, none of that's going to matter. And 
He says it in this way. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And he says, our fa um, in, in verse uh, 22, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. So he doesn't back down off the truth of that. But, however, an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. And what does Jesus say to her? I am He. And we see also the clear difference, and I want to go ahead and kind of start wrapping things up, because throughout the book we see this theme over and over and over. The Jews seek after signs that they do not believe. And here, this woman of the Samaritans instantly believes she understands who she's talking to were there any signs? Just him saying to her about things, her. things about her and he told her right away that he knew that she had told him the truth. Correct. Question. And here the, the woman is wanting physical water. <clears throat> she she wants somehow Hey, you you can give me this water that's like an endless supply. It's gonna you know be there forever for me. That's great. One, where is it? How can I get that? And both here and in John six, when they come to him seeking for bread and mm -hmm. more food, he he turns that and says, "That's not what I'm here for. That's not my purpose. I'm here to provide salvation. I'm here to you know redeem your soul." And so many still to this day are seeking a physical, material blessing from God. They think that's what God and the religion of Christ is about. And he just constantly emphasizes while he did things in the physical realm, he's constantly emphasizing, no, no, no. I'm here about your soul. Yeah, I'm not here for food, fun, and frolic, as we say a lot of times. You know, and, and Tanner and I, um, this past Sunday, we had to drive through Denver, and we go through one of the big churches out there and they had all these blow up things they were, I mean they were just having a big you know fair out there and uh, I said Tammy you want to stop there and get some hot dogs <laughs> he said he said no and I said well that's why Jesus died I guess that's why Jesus hung on the cross so that we can have all that fun stuff and you know and just trying to instill in him that there was a purpose and a reason that Jesus came down to here and we see it being played out, first of all, in or being spoken about in John chapter 3 and now in John chapter 4. And this is the reason that he came, to offer eternal life to people, not to offer all of that other stuff. And so, um, whenever the disciples come back, this woman leaves and she goes to tell her neighbors, and guess what the neighbors say? They come and they talk to him. And what do the neighbors say? We don't believe because of the woman. We believe because we, we've now seen you, we've heard you. Right. Exactly. We, we've heard you. We, we hear the words. Now remember, again, and I pointed this back to this whenever we talked about whenever you know Jesus is at the tomb and He says Mary and then she recognizes the voice. What is it Jesus says about His flock? They, they, they hear Me and they know Me. And so this is being played out again. And those who believe the words of Christ are those who are of His flock. These attesting miracles and signs are, are there just so that we know that what He says is the absolute truth. And it has a very distinct ring to it. And um, you know, when you look at all of the confusion that happens in the world and all these doctrines and everything else, what all of us who sit in here today and have obeyed the, the Gospel what we hear is something very distinct from all of that. 
all that noise and chaos that's out there, and yet the truth still rings true. Um, and so we see that um, in verse 41, many more believed because of His Word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for what we heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Now when they make the Savior of the world, they say that includes them also. So they are wholeheartedly accepting Jesus. Alright, any questions or comments? I'm sorry, but that's as far I did not think I was going to make it through. So, you know, even when I got up here, I'm like, how far do I really want to get into this? But that is really kind of John in a nutshell, is you have these people who, have, who are looking for signs and they would not believe, and then you have these words that are spoken and people do believe. And so you have this constant battle between in ourselves that we ought to see ourselves in between what is physical and what is spiritual. They wrestled with it, we wrestled with it, and that's why John was written. And as we look at John chapter 20 and how it uh, wraps up, in uh, verse 24, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus comes. And then he makes that statement that unless I can see that physical, I will not believe. And then Jesus shows up. And Thomas says, My Lord, my God. And what is it that Jesus told him? Because you've seen that physical thing, that's why you believe. But there's going to be a generation that comes, there's going to be people who come that will not be able to see, and yet they will still believe. And that's us. There's nothing else I'll go to close the class.